Hello again. And so here we are. I am going to talk about a little bit about the moon. Something came up about the moon today. Uh, I saw something on X, it used to be Twitter. Someone was talking about the moon seems a bit dodgy <laughs> or something like that. There's very many things about the moon. So I'm going to read something from my book about the moon and talk about the moon a little bit. Uh, let's see where we go. See what you think. Okay, so this is in my book. First book. I'm still going through it. Chapter of the Moon. I have written. Uh, one strange dream I had was of the moon. I was in the field adjoining my house running through the green grass when I turned around to see the hedge that runs parallel to the track of my house. The track to my house, I should say. Instead of seeing just the sky above the hedge, I saw the moon. But not at the distance one usually equates with the moon. This time it was like the moon was almost touching the earth. The whole of the sky was filled with the upper half of the moon as if you were in a spacecraft and flying so close to the moon that it was all you could see. It was awe-inspiring inspiring and breathtaking. Why have such a dream? What could it mean? It would give me a lifelong interest in the moon and some other odd experiences with seeing the moon. I always wondered if, in fact, it was a memory of perhaps seeing the moon in exactly that way, perhaps aboard a spacecraft. So I was just wondering whether that time my first encounter in 77 whether I went aboard the craft and whether we went up and got close to the moon or even went on the moon who knows because why would I see it like that it was just it just filled the whole of the horizon you know I saw the horizon in this dream and the moon was just you couldn't see anything but the moon in the sky it was that close so I wonder if that was a memory in fact of me seeing the moon close up does it have to have been from a spacecraft whether in a, a life before this life or whether or whether it was on that ship. Don't know. Yeah, anyway. So I was wondering when I was writing this whether it was because I was taken on the craft. Another odd experience with the moon was much la later in life when I was in my early 40s. I was driving to work one morning. I started at 4am, so it was between 3.30 and 4 when the moon came when the moon as I came up towards Maidstone in Kent was nearly full and up to my left hand side southeastwards. I noticed how beautiful it looked in the clear morning sky. The very next day I was driving again at the same time along the same road when I noticed the moon was off to my right. In a lower angle than the previous morning and in the southwesterly direction. How was this possible? Surely I wasn't the only one to notice. Mind you, there's hardly anyone about at that time of day. In the winter, on a dark, cold morning, sometimes the moon can seem closer to the earth than at other times, and there is a strange atmospheric effect with magnification of things on the horizon. And this could be why the moon seems closer sometimes when viewed on the horizon. But at other times, it certainly seems larger than it does normally. Does it move? Is it actually under the control of an intelligence? The feeling that the moon is more than a dead satellite comes to my mind often. There is interesting information pointing to the fact that I may be right. There is evidence for the moon being a hollow object. It comes from the fact that when meteors strike the moon, the latter rings like a bell. More specifically, when the Apollo crew in November 20th, 1969 released the lunar module, after returning to the orbiter, the modular impact with the moon caused their seismic equipment to register a continuous reverberation like a bell for more than an hour. The same effect occurred on Apollo 13's third stage, which caused the moon to ring for over three hours. Over three hours. Just to have one of the third stages. The third stage hit the, uh, hit the surface. Two Soviet scientists, Vasin and Sherbakov, have spent much of their careers examining the facts compiled on lunar phenomena. Their conclusion is that the moon is artificial. 
possibly a hollowed out planet, and that it was steered from some distant region of the galaxy into a circular orbit around our planet, hence the extraordinary mystery of rock and moon dust age variations. They also claim that intellectual life has existed in the moon for eons. Also, as NASA envisioned it, astronauts will return to the moon within the next decade or so. And this was in 20, uh, 2011, I think it was. I wrote this. They were saying that. And they're still saying they're going back to the moon. They're getting ever closer. I think they're saying 2027 now. I oh, know 2027 for something going back to the moon, but not with people on. So, I mean, obviously, we'll get to it in the end, but this is if you think that we actually went to the moon, which is a whole other subject, but it's an important one to uh, talk about. So, also, as NASA envisaged it, uh, astronauts will return to the moon within the next decade or so. These astronauts will build a permanent base and prepare for a historic undertaking that will send explorers to Mars, using it as a base, obviously. As Clive Neal, Associate Professor of Civil Engineering, and Geo geological sciences at the University of Notre Dame envisions it the same astronauts may be in for a shocking surprise. Neil and a team of 15 other planetary geologists have re-examined data from seismometers placed by Apollo astronauts at lunar landing sites from 1969 to 1972. So we're just going along with the story that they land on the moon at the moment to cover that, okay? They found that instruments from Apollo missions 12, 14, 15 and 16 consistently radio back seismic data to Earth until they were turned off in 1977 in a NASA cost-cutting measure. I mean, how much money did they save by turning them off? If they're just running, why would you turn them off? If they're on the moon and you have a connection with it, the only cost-cutting you'll be is just not paying someone to look at the data. You could just still let it collect it, couldn't you? This just sounds like a load of old bollocks. The moon is seismically active, Neil said. When a quake occurs, the moon rings like a bell, as I previously explained. Between 1972 and 1977, the Apollo seismic data detected 28 shallow quakes, Neil said. A few of the shallow quakes registered up to 5.5 on the Richter scale. A magnitude 5 quake on Earth can move heavy furniture and crack plaster. The moon is a technology testbed for establishing such networks on Mars and beyond, he said. And the source of that information was from the University of Notre Dame by William G. Gilroy. Yeah, all very interesting stuff, so we'll get to talk about that. Oh, there's another book, not mine, <laughs> that I recommend, and it is Invader Moon by Rob Shelsky. I've had this book for a while. I've always been fascinated by the moon because of the various things. And uh, it says, Invade a moon. Who brought us to the moon and why? Oh, sorry. Who brought, who brought us the moon and why? I think there's maybe some truth in that. We'll have a look at this just a little bit. We'll chat, chat about it. Now we come to the chapter that mirrors the title of this book. So he's done a whole lot of uh, pre-work before that, which is most of the book, to be honest. I haven't read it for a while, but I think I was quite pleased with it because it's very interesting. It makes some very good points. Our moon is a very strange satellite. It differs markedly in many ways from any other moon of the solar system. Some brief facts about our moon. Number one, the moon is the largest moon of any rocky world in our solar system. The moon's density seems to be too low for its size. Hence the ringing. The moon has an orbit that is very close to being perfectly circular when it should definitely be more of an ellipse. The top three layers of the moon seem reversed with the densest material on the surface and lighter layers below it. Number five, only the near side of the moon has mares, those huge flat areas that look so dark. The ancient astronomers thought they were seas, so they called them mares, which is Latin for seas. In case you didn't know. The far side of the moon has none of these. What it does have is an abundance of craters. It's covered in them. Number six, the origin of the moon is an ongoing and baffling mystery. Scientists simply can't account for how it came into our skies. 
there are no fewer than five different main theories as to how this could have happened. All of them seem to have major flaws, in fact so much so. One of the very latest theories, a newer one, now challenges the impact theory. The impact theory states that a Mars-like object struck, struck the Earth at an angle. This event resulted in a tremendous collision and debris exploding up from the Earth in great quantities. This free-floating debris coalesced into the moon of today. It sounds almost impossible anyway, doesn't it, already? Again, there are problems with this theory. I you think there are. Among these are the moon's density. The fact that the far side of the moon has a thicker crust than the near side. Certain elements found on the moon, etc. And also, you might say, say so, but also, uh, parts of the, the, rock, the dust and stuff on the moon, apparently, is a lot older than what the moon should be, and it's older than the Earth. So that really blows out of the water. Maybe he's going to say that in a minute. Maybe I'm getting ahead of, ahead of myself. The newer theory that the moon is the result of a natural georeactor near the equator of Earth that exploded, so the moon was thrown off into space when the Earth was still very young, has been promoted to compensate for problems with the impact theory. <laughs> However, this theory too has problems, so much so that most scientists still seem to prefer the impact theory despite its flaws. Good old scientists, eh? So today, scientists simply don't know for sure how the moon came to be in our skies. And that's, you know, isn't that just what people should say? Oh, we've got a theory, but actually doesn't fit all the facts. So it's just a theory, so we don't really know. But there kind of seems to be a lot of arrogance with a lot of things with science. Now this is how we say it is, and that's how it is. Anyway, not always, not by all scientists, but science in general. Uh, every few decades, they seem to come up with a different idea of how it could be, it seems. For a short while, each of these seems to be the prominent theory, before a newer one eclipses them. Yeah, but then uh, there is a natural progression though, isn't it? It's like me, you know, I, I can think something's like this, like I say, and, and as my experience and understanding and knowledge comes to me and deepens, I'll change my theory, or my understanding, or my perspective to fit the newer information i mean that's how it should be so i don't you know i don't think pointing them with that is really very useful then they are for all practical purposes discarded these newer theories you know you know that makes sense doesn't it isn't that logical these newer theories in their turn then try to answer the problems of the last one and somehow account for them this seems to be the real history of our moon an ongoing effort to account for the thing how it came to be in our skies. To date, we have only been partially successful in this effort because we simply can't explain all the odd things about our moon. No matter what theory we choose, each one lacks credibility in some fashion or another. One of the theories about the moon is that the Earth simply captured it at some point in its early history. This idea accounts for much about the moon being here, but it too has serious problems. It can't account for the nearly circular orbit, for instance, for existence. For instance, back in. among other things, like the density, angular momentum of the moon, etc. Another theory is the moon formed along with the Earth from the same dust cloud. This works well for explaining the similarity in materials of each world and the age of it as compared to Earth. They were born together from the same stuff. Nevertheless, the theory doesn't work in other ways, either because of a number of things. Again, the angular momentum is wrong, the orbit is wrong, and the fact that one side of the moon's crust is thicker than the other side, and so on. Another and very glaring problem with this theory is the moon's core is too small compared to the Earth's. There should be more in proportion. Additionally, there is that nasty little density problem again. The moon's density is too low for its size and relative to Earth's density. The orbit around the Earth is wrong for this theory. Besides this, the theory too doesn't explain how the difference for elements of the moon's surface, titanium, neptunium, etc., came to be composed to those of Earth, com compared to those of Earth. You know, spaceship moon theory, one theory that does account for how the moon came to be in skies, and it answers all the questions, solves all the problems of the other five theories combined. Unfortunately, this is one theory that mainstream scientists simply do not wish to entertain as a plausible idea, at least not most of them. That the moon was a spaceship and came to, and was brought there, basically. So, admittedly, it does seem like a far, idea, far out idea, but non-professionals did not come up with this idea. Rather, the theory is a product of two well-respected mainstream scientists, ones esteemed by their peers at the time. And it is, in fact, the people that I mentioned, which was Vassin and Sherbakov theory. 
that's how they that's what they came to that it was it came from somewhere else i'm recommending his book though so because there's lots of um peoples and tribes who talk about a time before the moon uh, i think maybe was it plato or not people before plato mentioned it let's have a look i think he mentioned a few things recorded history of time before the moon there is a good deal of evidence that humans remember a time when there was no moon in the sky or before the moon as many of them put it this evidence comes from a variety of sources both written records and oral ones which would seem to further enforce the idea to corroborate the theory of an invader or spaceship moon multiple sources are always better than relying on just one source in such matters when it comes to evidence the more there is the more diverse it is the better however exactly what are those sources so he's going to take a quick look so let's take a quick look at those sources the moon arrives at the time of the great flood as partial support for invader moon theory according to some legends it said the moon did not appear in the skies above us until around the time of the so-called great flood and i think that's all around the same time that lots of things seem to have changed or happened graham hancock goes on about one researcher henry kroll actually claims a specific year it is his contention based on his research the moon arrived in orbit of the Earth some 11,713 years ago. That's very close to the 12,000 figure that keeps cropping up in all sorts of ways with regard to human history. Isn't that at the end of the last ice age as well? Like the young, what they call the Younger Dryas. That's a very uh, important sort of date to remember. So many things point back to back then. The Greeks, you know, Aristotle tells of a time when there was no moon where the skies were moonless. As we all know, Aristotle was a revered and honoured academic of ancient Greece. Wasn't he indeed? And when talking about a moonless time, Aristotle referred to a people that lived in Arcadia. This was before his people, the Hellenes, had migrated to the region and settled there. So even by his own standards of the day, this was a very ancient time. Aristotle claims that Pelagassians, no, yeah, Pelasgians, were the existing race dominating the area when the moons arrived. He said these Pelasgians lived in Arcadia at a time before the moon. Aristotle was not alone. Two other prominent Greeks spoke of the Proselenes as well. Both Anaxagoras and Democritus mentioned them as being before the moon people as well. So convinced were they of the fact that they had no problem relating this as a standard history lesson to their students of the time. In other words, they taught it as a truth of history and not just a myth or a legend. Apollonius of Rhodes also talks of these pre-moon people as well. The Romans, nor were the Greeks alone in these beliefs, in these beliefs. No less than the famous Ovid said, the Arcadians are said to possess their land before the birth of Joseph, biblical Joseph, and the folk is older than the moon. The Americas added more support to the idea of the moon there are the Mayans. The Mayans venerated Venus as the main nightly celestial body. It took precedent over everything else. The Mayans referred to a time when there was yet no moon to rival the glory that was Venus. So that's on the other side of the planet. And Venus dominated the night sky. And they used their superior mathematical capabilities to precisely make predictions about the orbit of that planet. The Colombian tribe, the Cordilleras, is another group of people who believe there was a time when there was no moon. They always, to this day, start their stories of ancient times with the phrase, before the moon inhabited the night sky. In Bolivia, there are hieroglyphics, or more precisely pictographs, at Tiahuanaco, which blatantly state that the moon did not arrive in the heavens till about 12,000 years ago. Again, that references to a certain time, 12,000 years, keeps cropping up repeatedly. Uh, a lack of ancient moon maps. Leonardo da Vinci did a comprehensive one in 1505, but other than that, the depictions of the moon in the form of maps are indeed rare, and even more so the further back in time we go. This is unusual because, like the sun, the moon can be used to tell the seasons, since it too rises and sets at various points along the horizons in a repeat pattern that includes the solstice points. In addition, considering the moon is by far the brightest and most dominating thing in the nighttime sky, one would have thought it would have precedence second only to that of the sun in calendars. It does not. In fact, besides the sun, it would seem that the constellation of Orion is the next big feature, and or Venus, as with the Mayans. Why this is, 
is a mystery. No, or is it? I Invade the Moon by Rob Shelsky. I recommend that book if you're interested in the moon and wonder whether it did in fact always be there or not.